So my name is Temur Rahman. I did my undergraduate from uh, uh, from Amrike, and I did my masters from England, and uh, then I did my PhD uh, also from England. Um, and I looked at the class structure of Pakistan, and I became a very young academic. You could say I started teaching at the age of uh, well, 22, 23. Some of my students back then were. Uh, um, well, only a year younger than me. Uh, and the purpose behind, the, the objective I had when I started teaching was that I wanted to reach out to people and talk about progressive ideas. I wanted to talk about new ideas. I wanted to talk about uh, left-wing ideas. Uh, I wanted to talk about socialist ideas and so on. But what I found was that uh, while I was quite happy being a teacher, naturally, my outreach was limited to the students that I had. And at one time I tried, I thought maybe I could teach as, you know, classes that were very, very large. They went up to 120, 130 students, and that's still the case. Um, that I'm currently teaching a course in which I have about 130 students. But still, they are in the hundreds, and uh, that's relatively limited. If you can just play the presentation, please, that would be nice. So I wanted to reach out to the hundreds of thousands. I wanted to reach out to the millions even. And um, I thought about how I could do that. Uh, now sadly, uh, the way in which uh, uh, Pakistani society treats intellectual discourse is one in which most people don't really want to be too involved in an intellectual discussion. They think, oh, this is something that only intellectuals do. It's not something that uh, involves me as a common Pakistani, etc., etc. So I wanted to reach out to people in a way that would engage them in some of the ideas in which I was engaged in, and yet do it in a manner that uh, would not feel, uh, would, you know, would be uh, accessible to them and would not feel like there was some sort of an intellectual barrier between what I was talking about and uh, the conversation that we were having. So I set up about 10 years ago a band. The name of the band is Lal, uh, which is red, and the reason I named it, thank you. <laughs> and the reason I named it Red was because I was, or Lal, is because I was, uh, well, I was uh, wanting to sing the uh, poetry of people like Faiz Ahmed Faiz and Habib Jalib and others, Ahmed Faraz, etc., although we never ended up singing anything by Ahmed Faraz, at least not yet. Um, but that was the idea. And at first it was in incredibly successful. Uh, because there was a big movement going on in the country, which is the lawyers' movement. And uh, so we, were very, we became very much part of that movement. We became the soundtrack of that movement, uh, you could say, and we were supported by uh, especially what was then the largest uh, television channel network, which is Geo News. So we were, you know, front and center. But as that entire movement faded away, that was between 2006 and 2009, um, with my music, I began to think, well, what is it that I can do now? How can I utilize my music in the service of the progressive cause? And it was around that period after the attack on Lal Masjid in 2006 that uh, extremism in Pakistan and terrorism in Pakistan, uh, with, uh, sorry to use this word, but exploded on the scene, lit quite literally as well as figuratively. And I thought to myself, you know, this is the, if fighting against military dictatorship and bringing back uh, some form of democracy in the country was sort of what in political language is called the principal contradiction. Well, the struggle against religious extremism certainly seems to have become front and center uh, in, in, in the period that we seem to be entering into. So I started this program uh, in which I thought I would take Lal and instead of just making music videos that would be on YouTube or on TV, I would go to universities and colleges and schools all across the country and play for people. Except that's not so easy because obviously a band requires that you know you take several people with you and you have to have a sound system and you have to have logistical support etc. But nonetheless it took me a few years to to get that all together. The, in the beginning, I just went with my acoustic guitar and I started playing songs to children. But I, I sl slowly, I, you know, put things together where I would have, you know, enough um, uh, support by institutions themselves as well as by other people to, to be able to do that sort of thing. And I remember performing at uh, Bahauddin Zakria University in 2013, where I uh, met your current vice chancellor as well, who's 
was very incredibly supportive of that particular performance. अगर चाहे उस performance में मुझे ये भी याद है कि चंद जो सीटें थीं बच्चों ने इतनी चलाने मारी कि चंद सीटें भी टूट गईं. But he never complained about that, which is to thank you, sir, for you know inviting me there. Anyway, so I set up this whole campaign called Music for Peace with the belief that I could utilize the power of music. To fight extremism, that may sound wacky to you. It may sound crazy to you. It may even sound audacious to you, which is the theme today. But how could someone with a guitar on their shoulder, dancing and prancing around uh, on stage, fight people who are armed with guns and knives and rocket launchers and armored vehicles and so on and so forth? It sounds absolutely crazy. But the central idea that I had was that if we can get the people. of pakistan mobilized and organized to uh, roll back religious extremism and to create a society based on peace and tolerance that would be a force that would be more powerful than all the guns and bombs of the world put together so you may recall you may recall that in 2007 following the lal masjid uh, crackdown the a new organization was created in pakistan called the ttp the tehreek e taliban pakistan and fighting with them has cost cost the people of pakistan over 60000 lives many of them have been alleged terrorists many of them sadly have been innocent uh, civilians many of them have been security forces and so on it has also cost the war that they declared on us has cost us 123 billion dollars now you recall that we've been talking about the 12 billion dollars that we require in order to keep pakistan afloat for which mr imran khan our prime minister has been going shuttling between saudi arabia china and other countries well look at the damage that uh, religious extremism has caused pakistan it's at least 10 times the amount that we are so desperately running after so i released this album called umeed e sahar with one of my students uh shara mazhar who was then the vocalist of the band and uh, as i told you uh, uh it was it provided the soundtrack for the uh, for the lawyers movement we supported ehtisaz essen uh, sang some of his poetry as well and there you see a picture of me in a goatee um uh, and that's the cover of our first album and it was a it was a big hit and so the next particular phase in the next particular phase uh, we launched music for peace uh, our fight against extremism but as soon as i launched this uh, this uh, campaign fate would uh, fate played a pretty bad role which was that uh, i was playing soccer uh, i love playing sports uh, you know i was playing football and uh, somehow or the other i fell in a very bad way Uh, like a ballerina or something i felt like this <laughs> and it was because i was kicking the ball and uh, the other player decided that instead of kicking the ball it would be a lot smarter to maybe kick the person who was trying to kick the ball so he kicked me instead of kicking the ball and i went in you know sort of hawa uh, mein i thought of spun in 360 degrees oh, i'm exaggerating but anyway i fell back on my arm and twisted it and it shattered into eight uh, well it shattered the bone shattered into eight more than eight sort of small pieces it was really badly shattered and so i went to the doctor and i said doc sir jaise bhi theek karna hai you have to make sure about one thing i became very depressed actually i said you have to make sure i don't care how much pain you put me through but i need for this arm to work exactly as it did before because i spent you know decades of my life sort of perfecting a craft to play music etc and now you know if i lose the flexibility in my wrist and the movement of my hand etc then i will lose you know an art a craft that i've spent 20 years trying to perfect he said are you sure what you, about what you're saying i said i'm absolutely sure it doesn't matter how painful it is so he decided okay we're going to make a wolverine situation out of this let's test mr or dr taimur rahman's pain threshold here so he did this operation in which basically he took a drill and drilled into my bone and then he took a screw and screwed into this thing into my bone to make sure that my arm was straight he didn't put it into a traditional you know cast and all that sort of thing and when i woke up you know that scene in x men when when uh, what's his name the actor huge jackman wakes up and ah, he comes sort of comes out like that it's such an amazing scene right well i came out of my coma and i wasn't going ah like that but believe me 
I have never experienced the kind of pain that I did uh, uh, when I woke out of coma, etc. It was pretty bad. Um, but luckily, after about two months, my arm did recover. And at first, and it was through playing music that it mainly recovered because you need a lot of physiotherapy after you've gone through something of that sort. So I started playing guitar and my arm was really, really stiff. And my doctor said, the more you play, the more it will open up and you'll be fine. So that's how I started. And I started going to uh, underprivileged schools, schools that could not afford to have a band, etc. with just my guitar at first. Started playing for children. And I cannot tell you, I cannot even describe, I don't have the words to describe how much love, affection, and warmth I found in the people of Pakistan and in the children of Pakistan. They screamed, they hollered, they danced, they sang. And it was not just the children. It was not just the staff members of these schools, etc. I was standing and they were giggling, etc. It was even the faculty members and the principals and teachers of these schools and colleges and universities who would be like, Hambi, apni jivani mein Taimur sahab, Hambi kuch college mein hua karte the. Or they came and they would sing with me, etc. And you know, I mean, spreading that kind of joy uh, brought so much joy to my life that uh, really I've documented so much of it but there's so many gigabytes of footage that I couldn't possibly put it all together. So I, in the beginning I thought you know maybe I'd do 10, 20 concerts but they grew and grew as people as I put it on social media people came forward and volunteered and said hey has a chunk of money go and do it uh, you know do this even more etc. Oxford University Press gave me a huge uh, you know, um, uh, support, etc. They said, let's go into schools and colleges and let's do this. And it grew from 20 concerts, it went to uh, 171 when I made this particular presentation. It's now touching 200. And uh, in, in just two years, that is, uh, while I was teaching and doing all the other things I was doing. And my Facebook uh, page went from 400,000, which is great, and jumped to over 1.2 million people. It was just absolutely wonderful. Uh, so, a little bit of, what do you call it, uh, what's the right word for it, self-promotion here. Uh, you know, somebody wrote back to me on Facebook and I really thought about it and it, it was true. They said, do you, rec do you realize that this is the longest, most sustained music campaign in recent Pakistani history? There was a time when Nayyara Noor sang uh, Fez and Iqbal Bano sang Fez, etc. That cassette was available on EMI. And that became the soundtrack for the struggle for the restoration of democracy, etc. But uh, to go to people in this particular way, in such a, you know, and to dedicate so much time to it, they said, well, you know, this is absolutely fantastic. So I'm proud that I think, you know, uh, when I hang up my guitar, uh, when I'm retiring and I hang up my guitar, uh, when I'm retiring from life or whatever it is, I will always look back at this time that I spent with the children and people of Pakistan and think it was one of the greatest achievements of my life. So why music? What, what, what can music do uh, in re relation to religious extremism? And why did I select music as a vehicle to fight religious extremism? My mother in the 1980s was involved with a very radical movement called the Women's Action Forum. They were campaigning against uh, the Hadood laws and other laws that had been brought in by the military dictator, General Ziaul Haq. And I saw through, by looking at where, if I was a little boy back then and hold my mother's hand and go into these demonstrations, I was very, very young. Uh, uh, so, and I recall the music, the poetry, I recall Habib Jalib, coming to the WAF demonstration and reciting Ab dehr mein be yaro madadgar nahi hai hum pehle ki tarah be kaso lachar nahi hai hum and the women and all the men over there going absolutely crazy and I thought to myself what a and of course there was the Fez festival held at the Alhamra open air and I thought to myself they, you know what distinguishes Pakistani culture is this incredible poetry and music of resistance that you don't actually see in so many other parts of the world. When I go to India now to perform, etc., they don't have this level of progressive poetry. They look up to people like Fez, Ahmed Fez. They look up to people like Habib Jaleb, Ahmed Faraz, Ahmed Nadim Kasmi, and others. And so I thought, well, you know, this tradition, 
We really need to revive this progressive tradition amongst young people who already have it in their genetic code uh, to enjoy poetry and music. And so why not deliver a message, the message of tolerance, the message of peace, the message of uh, uh, harmony uh, to young people through the instrument of music. So let me just say, we have sadly uh, never truly understood the value of the arts uh, since the 1980s in Pakistan. We think that what is relevant is merely your intelligence quotient, which is a measure of your rationality. And no offense to Parvez Hootboy, who is a great scientist, and so am I, but science and rationality is only one way in which human cognitive activity occurs. A very important way in which human cognitive activity occurs is through what people are describing as emotional intelligence. The way we relate to each other, the way we talk to each other, the way we communicate with each other, the, the emotions that we express. And I'm not saying they are, again, they are anti-rational or whatever, but what I am saying is that a huge part of who we are and how we talk to people cannot be learned merely by learning the laws of logic or the laws of science or the laws of, uh, you know, uh, deduction or whatnot. They are learned through somewhere else. Where did you learn that if you like someone, you to do it where did you learn that if you are a university professor, you will be able to do it? The Tazib that you love, you will be able to do it. What do you think about it? What do you think about it? What do you think about it? So, if we really look at all civilizations, what we realize is that what we call emotional intelligence is, is really uh, within. Uh, the terrain of culture. Culture is nothing but the collective repository of the emotional intelligence of a civilization itself. That's why culture is so important because it is your, it is really defines your civilization. And so that's why I feel that rather than ignoring culture as a means to, to bring about social change, it should be front and center. Now, as I look through history, let me tell you, one of the central questions jo, as a civilization which we discuss in Ambar Bar, is that why did the Maghrib get out of the Jamaluddin Afghani, Alam Iqbal, so many others have been talking about this issue. Why did their science and technology get out of the way? We were in the dark ages, now we are in the dark ages. So, if you have studied Europe's history, so you will realize that the scientific revolution hai, it was preceded by another inkalab in Europe in which science was not related to science which we call Renaissance, Renaissance Humanism. And that was purely an art movement, a cultural movement, a philosophical movement, an educational movement. Bhi thi, but it was the, the philosophy of that new hum humanism was expressed mainly through the arts. It was through, it was through uh, Leonardo da Vinci, it was through Raphael, it was through uh, uh, Michelangelo, it was through some of the great Italian artists that the ideas of humanism were, were expressed. And similarly in Pakistan, when the progressive movement developed, it was mainly through poetry and music that the progressive ideas of Pakistan, or, or, or the progressive philosophy of Pakistan was popularized. So that was the idea. The idea was I would try to engage the youth. The idea was I would uh, break free from merely talking to the people who were already convinced of progressive ideas. I would go and talk to other people who were not convinced. And I would try to, in fact, politicize. It sounds like a horrible word, but it's, it's a good word if, if, the, if, um, if you're not just talking about which party to support, but politicize in the sense that you think about politics and the politics of Pakistan and you discuss ways to solve the political, economic and social problems of Pakistan. So I would try to politicize and mobilize the young people of Pakistan, people like you, people below the age of 30. And of course, no movement comes without its difficulties and problems. And uh, uh, in Lal Band was also known for a while as Lal 
banned. Yani ke it was banned by PEMRA, it was banned by PTA. Uh, recently, there was another controversy, which I won't get into. But, you know, I generally tend to quote, lot, quote controversy. Uh, because anybody who's trying to change society is going to quote some controversy with respect to the people whose thinking they are rejecting and the new thinking that they're trying to bring about. So, so that's working. Is it working? Well, one thing I can, I can tell you is awareness is something very difficult to quantify. I can't really put a number on it. But one thing I can tell you is it has resonated with people. People have enjoyed it, loved it. They supported me. They gave me money to, to, do, these, to, to do these things. They opened their doors to me. Today, UCP opened its doors to me uh, in much the way that so many other institutions have. And so I think, yes, it's working. That's why I'm standing in front of you and so on. So um, the struggle continues. Yesterday, it was my mother on the streets uh, of Lahore. Today, it's my wife and myself. That's, that's the center picture. And tomorrow, I hope it will be my daughters, Zara and Zoe, who will continue to work for a new and better Pakistan.